Hey everyone, I'm Scott Cunningham, aka Scott C Business, and today we're here with Crypto, or rather, sorry, Wendy O, but you might also know her as Crypto Wendy O. And uh, we're just going to be talking about some of the stuff that she's up to and um, and then just kind of freeballing it a, a little about what's happening in crypto and blockchain. So uh, if you just want to introduce yourself a little bit, that'd be awesome. Hey guys, it is Wendy O here. Most of you know me as Crypto Wendy O. Um, but yeah, I do a lot of different stuff in the space. I'm a content creator. I've got a YouTube channel and I also have a marketing consultancy. I do like marketing and um, private events for companies and even big events for companies. And um, yeah, I'm happy to be here and thanks for having me. Awesome. Awesome. Absolutely. So um, first up, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, your show and what that's all about. So when did you start The O Show? So I actually started, um, I've had my YouTube channel since summer of 2018, um, but I originally started it to just, to. I never planned on making content. The only reason why I started it is because I wanted to um, live stream my meetups because I was doing a lot of um, technical analysis for beginning meetups. And I wanted, I had an audience on Twitter that I, and I wanted to reach. So I wanted to make sure that everybody was like included because not everyone could come to the meetup. So I started doing that. And then, um, I got enough confidence to go ahead and start talking about like technical analysis, just like basic stuff and giving like market updates. And anytime I had an idea regarding like a chart or like a setup, I would share it. And then it kind of transformed into me get, getting jobs doing sponsored content. And then, um, and then I decided like a year later that I was going to start doing like daily shows with news updates and just kind of talking about my thoughts and my opinions on different things in the space. And yeah, I, I never had an intention of doing, doing, this like full time or anything else. It was just kind of, it kind of just happened. Okay. So it's, so it was originally kind of an extension of what you were already doing in the physical space for, for blockchain and crypto. Yeah. So it was basically just to showcase my meetups because I was doing, I was really focused on doing um, like technical analysis meetings for beginner meetups for beginners. So I'd basically sit in front of the room and then I'd talk about just like support and resistance and like basic trading strategies. Cause I was just learning myself and I still am learning every day. Um, and it wasn't just me like teaching. It was me just talking about, you know, what works for me, what I like. And then people would come and they would chime in. I've had very experienced traders come and like co-host the meetups with me and, you know, just different stuff like that. So I just wanted to include everybody and it was a good way for me to include everybody was on YouTube. Okay, awesome. And and how uh, how often do you do those meetups? Um, so I have actually stopped doing those for right now because I'm on my last semester with school and I'm almost almost done. But I was doing them on a monthly on a no, it was a weekly basis. I was doing them on a weekly basis during the summertime and then school started. So then I started doing them monthly. And then the mark, we were like in this terrible bear market. So I just would only do them like if people requested that I come to their event and, you know, like co-host with them and whatnot. And now I just do mm -hmm. like, I do like regular monthly meetups, like networking meetups in Los Angeles. But once school is done, then I'm going to have more freedom to go ahead and do it. Um, most people don't know that if you live in Los Angeles or California, the commute time to go anywhere is never under, it's always like, it takes forever to get everywhere. So I was going, I was commuting yeah. like, like two hours round trip to go do these meetups in San Pedro and they're fun, but I also have a three-year-old. So I have to, you know, I've got to designate my time specifically and, you know, stuff like that. So I will start doing them again, but it will, I need to fit. I have my last semester and I got to finish this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you're definitely juggling a lot of things, being a parent, going to school, all the meetups, and then also your, your, your marketing. So, so yeah, definitely a lot to juggle there. Um, so so when did you start doing the meetups then like was it uh, a long time before you started doing the Osho or, or or what was that like? Yeah, so the meetups came first and it, basically what it was like all I want my whole purpose of doing those is when I first got into crypto at the end of 2017, there was a lot of meetups on meetup.com, but they were charging people and they were com they were mm. companies that were shilling their ICOs or they're doing like all this weird stuff. And I'm like, this is stupid. I was like, I want to learn more about crypto. I want to, you know, and I want to help other people learn. So I figured the best way to do it was at like a very casual um, like a very casual setup, like setting to where it was like, you know, like at a bar or a brewery or like a restaurant where people we can come and we can eat and we can talk about stuff and, you know, just kind of, kind of chill and relax. So that's where, so that's why I started doing them. Cause I just wanted to meet more people in the space and network with people. And then it turned into this really big thing. And then I've been given opportunities where I'm hosting meetups and events professionally. People want me to, you know, host their events for them and coordinate them. And it turned into a really cool thing. And I'm like, I'm happy that I'm doing them and I can't wait to do more. 
Yeah, that's awesome. And and obviously, I guess you'll start up again fairly soon when you uh, when you finish your last semester. Uh, yeah. So what what are you what are you going to school for? So originally, <laughs> originally I was a bio major because I wanted to become a pharmacist. But then I found out how much it costs to go to school to become a pharmacist, and I realized that if I was to become a pharmacist, you're very kind of restricted to what you can do. And my personality is more I want to be able to be free and kind of do what I want to do. And I didn't want to pay three hundred thousand dollars to go into debt to have one job like filling pills for the rest of my life. It just wasn't, um, it wasn't for me. So I, I enjoyed working with people and I enjoyed talking with people and problem solving, but I didn't want to just stay with that. So then I switched from that, from, um, from pharmacy to business and I, my concentrations in marketing, cause I'm doing that right now pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I can relate to that cause I went to school for uh, networking and it security. Mm -hmm. And then when I got out, I went into uh, marketing as well. So uh, I can kind of relate to that uh, that sort of flip there. Um, so you before we jumped into this, you mentioned you started using uh, Note, and it is a social media dApp. Uh, you said you're not on a lot of other ones, but I actually haven't heard of Note. So do you want to dive into that a little bit? I'm, yeah, I'm interested so, to hear your thoughts on it. So this is not sponsored at all, you guys. And it's not really, it's, I don't want to say it's necessarily a DAP, but it's like, it is a, it's like a social media platform and you can, it's very similar to like Facebook and to, I was going to say MySpace, <laughs> very similar to Instagram and to Facebook and Twitter, but you can tip people. And I don't necessarily know if it's like, you know, I don't know how the inner workings of it, but there's a lot of crypto people in there. And then you're actually tipping people for their content or like for things that they say and it's pretty cool it's a lot of fun because it's and there's no censorship on it which is really awesome so you, there's a lot of like like you know fun posting going on and just kind of being ridiculous and i post some charts on there at times but that's probably um that's one of the platforms that i do like to use um and it's easy to use i'm all about ease i'm not a technical very technical person and if something's really people are always like can you try my app can you try my dab can you do this and i was like well um it's kind of hard for me to use and it takes a lot of time for me to figure out and if it takes me more than like 10 minutes to set something up i don't you know it's it's too it's too much for me <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, no, that's fair. There's definitely, there definitely needs to be more focus on ease of use for a lot of the uh, dApps out there. But yeah, yeah, no, that's cool because I, I spent a lot of time like looking for different dApps to review and check out and uh, I haven't actually heard of that. So I'm definitely gonna have to check that out. Yeah. And, uh, it, and you said it was note just like N O T. -E. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm double I'm double checking right now. But yeah, it's called Note and the it's called um they're on Twitter. Yeah, it's called Note. And it's just okay. really it's it's really cool. It's just fun. Like they don't have video, like they're still the devs are still working on it, but they've been around for a while and I've met the founder. Um he is a Los Angeles local and he's got a family too. And like it's you know, I met them on Twitter and then we they came to a couple meetups and whatnot. So I like to support I like entrepreneurs, I like small projects, but it also has to be pretty easy for me to use because I'm not gonna pre about something and talk about a project if it's not something that I'm going to use really every day or if it's hard to use because most of the people I know if I were to tell them to even to to use some of these dApps or to use some of these platforms they kind of look at me like Ooh, like what is this like it's hard to use and I'm the same way like I like things to be easy I don't have time to really like tinker with stuff and to play around with stuff like I have a three-year-old that demands my attention pretty you know pretty viciously so I got to make sure that she's all taken care of and whatnot and and all that stuff yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so are you kind of kept up with any of the other things in like the social media dap space? Like just recently, um, Tron, like Justin Sun from Tron mm -hmm. acquired Steam it. Do you know anything about that drama kind of going on right now? Because yes. I'd love to hear your okay. I'd love <laughs> to hear your thoughts on that. Uh so, so I actually reported on it two days and um, oh, okay. it's actually a pretty complicated thing. Like I didn't realize yeah. how, I didn't realize how in depth and how complicated and complex this whole thing is. Um, but I had someone from the Steam, I'm really good friends with Justine and she's on Twitter. She's absolutely amazing. But she had posted about it. I was like, what the F is going on? So I'm talking to her and that, cause I had reported or, you know, commented that on my on my channel that Justin had acquired Steam because it's important and I'm still mm -hmm. trying to get someone from the Tron side to come out but they keep telling they don't I don't think they really want to do too much like t to talk about it and whatnot mm -hmm. so um but I had I had reported on it two days in a row and then I had um then I had someone from the Steam community come on we did an hour and a half live stream and he basically broke everything down and he was the founder of I think it's called three speak which is like a video streaming platform on okay the yeah Steam. they call me Dan yeah uh, on the on the steam blockchain so it was just like 
like it's just a pretty it's a pretty complicated thing because you have like Justin purchased Steemit. He didn't purchase the actual blockchain. But when you're thinking of at least me, when I'm thinking about um the whole thing, it kind of it makes me think that he purchased the Steam blockchain because doesn't Steemit kind of need kind of works concurrently with Ste like Steam and Steam and don't they kind of work concurrently mm -hmm. together? So that was that part was a little bit confusing. But then I found out okay, he didn't purchase the actual blockchain. The actual blockchain is sp supposed to be decentralized. But then the way that the the DPoS voting and all that stuff works, it seems like it may really not be all that decentralized. And then we talked about like the the soft fork that occurred and why they did the soft fork. And then the big the big amount of voting power that Justin had, and then how he you know used the those three exchanges to kind of power up those votes and do all that stuff. So the whole case is very complex. And again, I'm not a I'm not a like a Steam supporter and I'm not a Tron supporter. Um, but I do understand the importance of decentralization and why it's important. And I do think that this this particular event that happened, why it's going to be so important for other for other similar cases because you are going to see people that create these dApps or create these projects and these platforms that are kind of partnered or kind of using these blockchains but they're not going to when they're sold the blockchain isn't going to come with it necessarily so it's a very interesting and unique situation <laughs> nonetheless yeah yeah it is uh it is definitely a uh an interesting situation yeah like uh like the big thing for me was that that the exchanges were using like mm -hmm. liquid funds from users to vote on you know a, a blockchain and on the governance of a blockchain that they're not involved with at all and that's the scariest like thing for mm -hmm. me because it sets a really crazy precedent that uh binance might just like get involved in some project and um and now their funds are locked into steam for 13 weeks exactly so, exactly so people That's who want to sell their steam off of off of binance can't right now because uh there's such a low supply that if everyone was trying to to sell out or like withdraw they wouldn't be able to so um because one of the things that justin wanted to do was when he took over he would make it so that the power down only takes three days so that the exchanges could just power up at any time you, you know do some voting and then power down and get their money back but now they're locked in for 13 weeks so it's it's just all around bad for people who want to use right. the exchange for people on steam uh yeah so it's it's it was basically a hostile takeover that didn't really effectively work because all of the steam all the people on steam banded together and got the original witnesses or at least enough so, of them so yeah. that they couldn't make the change but um but yeah but it's definitely a crazy precedent the thing that's crazy is like number one like you don't leave don't i don't advocate for people the only people that i think it's okay for them to leave their stuff on exchanges are traders because i'm a trader and as a trader if i have everything on my ledger or i have you know stuff that i'm but I'm actively trading, like stashed away, like I'm going to miss my opportunity to, you know, to trade it. So those are the only people and those are, and I'm not saying that this is okay, but it's really just for experienced traders that know what they're doing and understand the risk that should keep their stuff on exchanges. But, a, but nobody else has any business keeping their stuff on exchanges at all. So to me, it was kind of crazy that that many people had their stuff on exchanges. And then it's also crazy that that you can vote from an exchange. I had no way, like, I don't know too much about the, the DPOS mechanism and the governance and how it all works because I'm not a Steam community member, but it just seems crazy that you can vote from an exchange. Like, do, well, don't what they did is they, they took all of the funds and then they put them into their Binance account on Steam and then they voted from there. Okay. So all the funds are locked up in their Steam account now uh, and they can't, they have to every every week they get a thirteenth of it back for thirteen weeks, and then they can put it back into Binance. So right now it's all locked up on their Steam account, which I mean evidently makes Steam more valuable, but um, but it's, it's locked up. Yeah, it's just and I like I also talk I talked to um, I talked to them about uh, like the lockup period, and I think the lock like. I think the lockup period is kind of a good, uh, good length. I mean, obviously, that is thirteen weeks is a really, really long time, but I do think it's kind of a good lockup amount of time because it's going to force the people that are vote voting and the witnesses to kind of before they vote on something to be like, okay, well, if we vote on this, then our tokens are locked up for this amount of time, so we better vote correctly. And also, too, it kind of gives a really nice cool down period, like after you vote to be like, okay, this is what happened. 
you know, is this, was this the correct choice and whatnot? So I think, I think the lockup period is kind of genius on that part. Um, Cause humans, we, you know, we have all these emotions and, and feelings and thoughts about things, but it's still, it's, mm-hmm. it's a very, it's a very, very complicated situation. And I think it's going to continue to play out. I think this is just the early stages and there's going to be a lot more interesting things that happen. There's going to be a lot more cases that come out that we're going to see that are very similar to this because a lot of projects are built around specific blockchains. And that's when you purchase something, it's, you might not necessarily get that blockchain. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and they recently did like a one hour meeting between Justin and all the witnesses. Um, and it didn't seem like they really came to a conclusion. Like I watched the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't know, we'll see. They were also supposed to do a like town hall meeting today. So we'll see if that still happens. Um, but yeah, definitely, definitely really interesting. Um, and, and it definitely had scary precedent from exchanges. Yeah. I mean, there, but they're, the thing is, is they're centralized exchanges. There's, I don't want to say they're like banks, but they hold that you've got an F ton of money on there. And, you know, I just, I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily trust exchanges, but I use them to trade on them, but I wouldn't leave, I wouldn't leave like huge amounts of money, like on an exchange, especially a crypto exchange, because they're not banks, they're not FDIC insured. And it's just not, um, you know, it's still the wild, wild west, there's really not a whole lot of laws and regulations to help consumers, really. So I don't know, I mean, to each their own, they can do what they want to do. It just didn't, I I mean, I'm not really taking sides, because I I understand Justin's side, because he paid a lot of money for this. But then I Mm -hmm. understand the community member side, too, because this is, you know, a lot of the people that are on Steam, they're very passionate about the project, and they're, they have their businesses built on there. So I get it. But at the same time, it's like, there was, it seems like the person who sold the people that sold steam it i feel like there's a miscommunication to justin about what was going to happen and there should have been somebody in there that kind of stayed on with justin for like a couple months to kind of do consulting regarding the culture behind the steam the, you know the steam steam it platform and the steam blockchain to kind of help him make that transition to do whatever yeah. he wants to do yeah there's talk now that there might be like a lawsuit um against mm-hmm. ned scott and um from justin and and i mean it's also you know partially like they didn't do their due diligence on Justin's part for like understanding that um the stake that he bought like the steam that he bought that steam it has has always been used for development of the blockchain and nothing else right. and that's kind of what started the whole debacle where the steam it witnesses or the steam witnesses made it so that he can't use that stake for voting and governance and then he went and got the exchanges and did all the things uh that we later saw and um, yeah, I guess he he just never knew that that was always meant for just government. Gov- it was never meant for governance. It was only meant for development. And um, and yeah, so I mean, like that's that's kind of how that all played out. And I, I think it'll probably end up in a like a lawsuit. But um, definitely. Yeah, but uh, I, I guess we'll have to see, right? But yeah, I, I definitely understand uh, both sides. But my hope is that they get through this and this doesn't negatively affect either chain at the end of the day. Um, Though I don't see them allowing for the power down from exchanges. I feel like the exchanges are just going to have to do their 13 week power down and never do that again, ideally, because we can't really like let them off the hook and just power down. Um, And a three day power down would just be like concerning all around because, you know, I don't think, I don't think it's as, yeah. Cause like, like, and not that I think this would happen, but say the witnesses did something that really pumped the price, but then would negatively affect it in the long term. And then they could just power down everything they own in three days and then sell out. Like, yeah, just any kind of situation could could be created uh, like that would be really, really detrimental to steam with a really short power down. So I really hope that doesn't change. And I think that that is just a really good uh, policy that they have in place right now. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting just to see what happens. Like I, I like people are I someone got mad at me. It was another YouTuber. They're like, Wendy's a Tron show and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, well, no, I'm t- I covered the story. I'm giving both sides of the story and I'm not a part of either community. I'm just saying I'm just giving my thoughts and opinions. And it just I feel I honestly feel like there was a miscommunication that was done during the sale and it wasn't done should have been done better. And it should have been done better by both sides, especially the people, the founders of Steam. And I feel like they really should have stayed on because in traditional markets in traditional business, when you sell sometimes when you sell a, a business, 
you you have some of the owners that'll stay on for like you know like three months or six months is like a grace period like a consulting period to make the transition smooth and that should have been done in this case can i don't know how much he paid for it but anytime there's a huge acquisition like that there needs to be some sort of like guidance <laughs> to to get yeah. through the to get through so that's just my opinion and i hope it works out and um i hope that that not that i hope that too many people are not impacted by it and it just it gets worked out and it gets solved because both are really big projects and have strong communities and it just sucks to see all this inner fighting so my two sets yeah 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 absolutely yeah like when when i originally found out about the acquisition the the main thing that i said is i just don't want the communities to both suffer because of it and um right. and and unfortunately that seems like it, what's happening now so hopefully we get to a better place as soon as possible but um but yeah, I mean, I mean, we probably don't want to dedicate this whole thing to uh, just that one, uh, <laughs> one that one instance. But I mean, it's definitely like really relevant news because it it's happened important, so recently. and it's so important yeah. because it's really it, it. And I've I've had I've done like I've done want to say I've done like a hundred hundred interviews with different projects, and some of them that have the consensus and the governance and the voting and all that different all that hoopla stuff. Yeah, I get it. But at the end of the day, is it really is it really decentralized? Because if you have somebody with if you got whales that have a large amount of of coin like who's not to say they're super rich people and they're elitist and you know they want you, you know who's not to say that things are going to be manipulated because of that so i don't really know if i believe in all of, of that because humans are always corrupted and people you can't always trust everybody all the time so it just goes to it goes to show that um there's always <laughs> there's always something that can happen and that can occur and to I guess to kind of stay ready and is decentralization is it really is it real because this shows that real like Steam was supposed to be a decentralized blockchain and it doesn't really seem all that decentralized now. Yeah, yeah, and I guess that's partly because of the exchanges and partly because you could just buy up a crazy mm -hmm. amount of stake. I think it was about ten million dollars worth of Steam that he bought. I don't know what he paid for the actual like company. Um, but I think it was about $10 million US worth of steam uh, yeah. that he bought. So yeah, it was a lot or no, it was, I want to say it was, I, I'm like, I have my notes here from the, the, from the thing I did. It doesn't matter. It just, it's just cuckoo either way you look at it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then the exchanges used, I think 84 million steam uh, combined to do mm -hmm. their uh, voting. So, yeah. And you know, it's funny cause I did talk about this, like in November, I said, if any one of the top steam holders, started to use their uh steam and stake it and then vote they could completely change out all of the witnesses that are currently on the chain and i and i and i thought to myself like that seems like a huge flaw in the system if there's millions and millions of votes but then 10 people could change all of those uh all, what all of those votes would would have wanted otherwise so yeah i mean it's definitely concerning when it's supposed to be decentralized but any like rich person could could potentially right. completely change that. But I guess the like the thought in my head would be that, you know, if someone like Justin bought all this stake and um, they didn't want it to be worth nothing, then they would have to probably do something good with it versus like do something negative with it. But people are concerned that he wanted to just do a token swap and then basically just move right. everyone to Tron. So that's kind of where that where that came up. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know what the outcome is going to be, but it's just like, is decentralization is it really possible with people when you have people involved? Like, at the yeah, point? I guess. <laughs> like, because yeah. Justin, he's he's monopolizing a lot, a lot of decentralized platforms. I think it was, is it D Live that he purchased as well? Yeah, yeah, he D Live he and D Live and then. He's yeah. just he's he's monopolizing all these things and that's fine. He's a businessman. I believe in capitalism. I, mean, I am a libertarian, but at the end of the day, like that kind of goes against the ethos of being in crypto in you know, be like fighting fighting the big guy. I think there's also a lot of elitism that happens in crypto and a lot of people don't talk about it, but I do because I see it <laughs> as I grew up poor and I grew up from the middle class. So I'm very aware that there is what you know about all this different elitism and a lot of people don't speak up about it. And I think it's something that should be talked about. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it gets kind of challenging when you've got like exchanges acting in centralized ways. And yeah, uh, and I, I guess that this just points to, you know, why people should have their own wallets, uh, why people should, you know, maybe consider using um, decentralized exchanges 
and you know all these different things that people should consider and um uh, and, and and again in Canada with uh, Quadriga going down and um you know everyone losing all their funds there just more and more reasons these days why people need to uh, take those precautions and, and have their own wallet. Uh, unless, obviously, like you mentioned, they're an experienced trader and they need their funds on there for trading. Yeah, I mean, that's the only reason why I can think of. And it's still really not a smart idea because if the exchange goes down, because I had all my I had a lot of stuff on Cryptopia because I like all those small, all those small capture Same. coins and stuff like that. And I lost yeah. a lot of money. So yeah. I mean, it happens that, but that, but at the same time, like I'm an, I'm a responsible adult and I understand, <laughs> I understand what investing is and I understand the risks, risks that are associated with it. And most people don't, and then they complain and they blame other people. And that's why I don't think we're anywhere near ready for mass adoption because the people that are involved in crypto now are supposed to be like anti-censorship, anti, like my keys, you know, like, you know, take responsibility for themselves and they can't even, then they, then when something bad happens to them because of a choice they made, they get upset and they blame other people <laughs> yeah yeah no that's definitely true uh there's there's got to be that trade of uh risk for and, and mm -hmm. convenience there's always got to be that balance especially in the crypto world where where everything is very decentralized so right. yeah i mean that that's something that people always got to consider um and um with a lot of the like social media apps that i use like steam uh there is no password recovery or anything like that so you know people got to be very, very uh, careful with uh, what they do with their private keys. So, I agree. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, is there anything else that you wanted to chat about? I, I only had a few things on my like topic list. Is there anything like up in the air that 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 has kind of got your uh, attention right now in the crypto space? I mean, the right now I'm just kind of chilling. I'm just like watching things. I'm chilling. I'm focusing on like you know my YouTube and growing that and making making daily content up in my editing game and stuff like that. But I think it's cool to see st see, see stories from today or yesterday. France announced that Bitcoin is a currency. We have South Korea that is accepting Bitcoin and India that passed these laws, you know, allowing Bitcoin trading or crypto trading in Bitcoin, um, basically stating that they're currencies and i think that is really cool especially for mass adoption but you know it's just the space is still it's still evolving we're also going in a transition where i feel like we're in a transition period and then on top of it with all this other stuff going on with the virus and that's all i'll call it is the virus because <laughs> i don't know where you're going to upload this i don't know if it's going to get censored or not but um yeah fair enough it's just it's absolutely crazy right now so i think i'm just like i'm just taking a step back i'm just kind of watching things and just like focusing on myself and you know my family and whatnot but you know i, I love crypto and i'm very immersed in the space but just kind of I'm taking a step back and i'm just kind of watching certain things and watching how they're playing out and how the space is changing and you know hope, hopefully more more and more people will come in and they'll you know they'll be excited about crypto but i do think it's going to take a while because it's still too hard to use yeah, yeah, and how how long was that uh, ban in uh, in India? Because, like you said, they just lifted that, right? How long was that? On I want to say I want to say it was two years. Either it was either I want to say it was two years. Um, I have my notes in no, that was South Korea. South Korea's was banned for two years. I'm not exactly sure okay. how long. I know India a couple months ago, maybe six months ago, they um, they reversed a ban regarding Bitcoin mining. You're allowed to mine in India, but you do have to um, you do have to be licensed and registered and complete all that different types of stuff. But all of these governments governments that are allowing Bitcoin to be used as currency and allowing for crypto trading, they're going to be imposing heavy KYC um, regulations. So a lot of people yeah. are like, oh, you know, I hate KYC and blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, the government, I'm not, I'm not, say, I'm not saying the government is good, but at the same time, these are the same people complaining about KYC that are going to cry if their stuff gets hacked and they don't have any legal recourse. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely true. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I recently, like, I I, I sort of like put this out there. I was like, is there some sort of like NFT KYC where you just do it one time and then you would just have an NFT of it That's and then cool. you could just use that anywhere you go. And there were some people who were talking about like solutions that are in the works and stuff. There's nothing right now, but uh, I think that would just be like such a huge upgrade for people in this space where you just do it one time and then you can just apply that like a non-transferable NFT representation of a kyc i think that would just be like really really game changing for the space true but then it's also going to be on the blockchain and people's privacy is going to be kind of imposed on i would think right 
Yeah, that's true. I mean, I mean, maybe, maybe like there'd have to be some way around it, like a private blockchain that is right. like a non-transferable <laughs> NFT. I mean, there's probably like a bunch of like, uh, like things that you have to get around it. But I, I was thinking about it like right now you can like tokenize like um like an academic achievement like a like your diploma or right. something like that so similar to that but in like a private chain i'm not sure if it's possible or you know like like i said some people said it was in the works but uh, i would love to see some sort of solution maybe even similar not exactly that but um but i think that would be huge for kyc cuz part of it is just like you don't want to give KYC information to every individual entity, right. but if right. you just did it one time through like one really good verified uh, like entity, and then you could just go from there, I think like that would be a lot less resistance um, for a lot of people. Have you heard about the new uh, EOS Voice uh, app I, that just launched? Yeah, no, I, I have. I've heard about it. I just am not a big EOS person because mm. it just kind of <laughs> it's congested. <laughs> it's you know, it was shilled very, very heavily, and the amount of money these people made from their ICO is absolutely absurd. And you know, I, I don't know. I'm just kind of, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just. No, I mean it's fair. I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm uh, like sometimes I'll do interviews with people who have uh, stuff on EOS, and uh, they they always say that like I'm really like critical of EOS. Um, so I, I, but they're always running on private block. Like they always do like side chains. That's why they make it work because I say like, if they weren't on a side chain, then it obviously wouldn't be working cause it's so congested. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm not able to try the uh, voice app yet because in Canada you can't get access. You can only get access in the U S currently, but, um, I'm definitely curious to see like what people think because it is KYC. Um, right. when most most dApps aren't these days. So uh, I'm really curious to see how that, like the resistance for that. Yeah, I'm just, I, yeah, my time is very limited now. And I'm there's like few things that I'll devote like extra time to like, kind of check out and whatnot. But it has to be, it has to be something that's going to make my quality of life better and make it easier. So like I use a crypto.com app, which is not a dApp. It's not a decentralized platform, but it's, I use that often and I love it because I use the card daily. So like stuff like that. And I use like Lolly and I use pay like stuff that's easy for me to use and actually will impact my life in a positive manner. Then I will, I'll take the time to use, but if it's not, if it's just like another social media platform or, you know, if it's going to take a lot of my time, then I'll be like, I'll, I'll take a pass. I'll, t I'll report on it. I'll talk about it, but I won't necessarily try it and test it out. Yeah, no, I mean, that's fair. You've only got so much time on your plate. And I mean, one thing that also really turned me off that platform is that you can't um, edit anything that you post, but it's like a blog platform. Oh, so. no, you need to be able. Well, OK, so this is a good topic because people are complaining about Twitter not having the edit feature. I understand why you don't have the edit feature, because it's going to be even more of a cesspool for misinformation. But at the same yeah. time, I get so I get why they don't have it. But at the same time, it's like I make typos like I'm busy. I'm not only chasing a toddler around the house and I'm on like a work call. <laughs> like I make typos when I'm on Twitter. It would be nice to be able what I think would be really cool. I think it'd be super cool if you can make edits to the platform or to, to the post. But if you do make an edit, you have to submit it like you like it has to have like a little like a little icon where you can qu click and be like, okay, this is what the original post was. So every time you go and you do an edit, like you can still see the original post and you can see why the person edited it. That would be cool. Yeah. Yeah. They have that on Facebook and I'm surprised that they've never like implemented that to Twitter and other platforms. Cause on Facebook, when I, you edit something, it says edited, you click on it and it shows you what it, what was changed. Oh, I didn't, you so, know, I had no idea that they did that, but that's, I, I think it's cool. And I think I get why Twitter doesn't want to do it. And I get why voice probably doesn't want to do it. But, but at the same time, it's like, we're human. We make mistakes. Like I've got, I've got Grammarly on my phone too, to help with grammar. I just downloaded it and I still make mistakes. So, you know, yeah yeah or or even just like if something needs to be corrected it's like what are you gonna do you just have to leave the false information there right. um so so yeah like i i don't know it'll be really interesting but um they're gonna be resetting all the tokens at the end of their beta anyways so i'm not super concerned in getting into the beta i'll probably just see it when it comes out um because i feel like most people might not be aware that all their tokens will be reset by the time it actually launches and and how how long that will be i don't know because steam it was in beta for four years uh so it's a long time you know, 
Yeah, yeah, I know, right? And, and if voice was not beta for four years, then you would not earn anything for four years. And if you did, it would be reset anyways. So, you know, um, it's crazy. Who knows? I can't uh, imagine a norm, like not, I don't want to say normal, but I can't imagine like average person like being that because most people I know, like they're not tech savvy, they're not technical people like for them to like, to wait that long and then have everything be reset just seems like an inconvenience you know i don't know that's just me though yeah i mean they'll they'll still have all their posts and stuff but anything you've earned will will be reset and uh, maybe it's just a precaution for like if people try to cheat the system or something but right. regardless I, that, yeah. that that'll still be the outcome where your stuff will be reset so it's like how much effort are you going to put into it until you can actually make money and buy it and sell it I don't know, but uh, I guess I guess we'll have to to see. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, um, like, do you have any thoughts on uh, like Ethereum and Ethereum two point oh? Okay, so again, not a technical person. I don't know much about the 2.0 and how all that how that is all going to work. But I do know that um, a lot of crypto projects are built on top of Ethereum. And a lot of people are saying Ethereum is going to die, it's going to go away. Ethereum's not going anywhere. If Ethereum goes away, the market is going to suffer severely. Um, so I, I, I do like Ethereum. And one of the reasons why I like Ethereum is it's fast and it does hold its value. You know, it does hold its value pretty well for the most part. So I do like to send like Ethereum, like if I have to pay somebody something like I actually had someone make a graph for, for me today and I paid them in Ethereum because it's fast and it's cheap to send. But I do I do like Ethereum and I think it will be around for a while. Yeah, yeah. For me, Ethereum has kind of been my go-to for my, like if I have to buy something on, uh, mm -hmm. on with crypto or like send some money, usually my go-to is Ethereum. And, and uh, a lot of people were saying that EOS was going to be like the enterprise chain. But I would say that uh, that Ethereum is, is the enterprise chain, and there's there's so many projects that are building on it, and like great projects that already exist, like Brave Browser and the BAT token, and, and or other. On, on one on Ethereum, or yeah, yeah, no, and also with Ethereum too, it's like you have the ERC twenty tokens, and you can just store them like majority of these tokens you can store in your ledger. That is absolutely amazing. Like that makes life so much easier. I remember um, I thought that I had sent um, tether to the wrong address, but I had sent it to, or I sent it to, I, I believe it was someone who was paying me to do something. So I gave them my ERC 20 address and um, they sent me tether and I was like, Oh my God, Oh my God, Oh my God. And it was to my Monarch wallet. I was like, Oh my God, I just lost money. But I checked with the Monarch wallet and Monarch supports ERC 20 tokens. And because um, Tether's an ERC twenty token. It picked it up, and I have my Tether. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, See, yeah, it makes life so much easier. Because EO, because okay, so EOS, uh, they have the what is it called? There's two. There's a, is it the password and it's a username or something to send EOS back and forth? I forget. Um. Yeah, I think it's still it's still sort of like the same thing. Like it's kind of similar to Steam, where you've got like your username and then you've got uh your your key to send it. It's just a lot like that is it's harder to send and it's more complicated. I remember I saw that and I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> it was a little yeah. bit confusing to me. And like, I think because I'm like with crypto, I'm used to these big, long addresses. OK, that's fine. But then uh, like seeing like I have to have this and I have to have that. It's like too much work. And I don't know, like I'm not I'm not a lazy person. I, you know, but it's just when you're dealing with money and you're like, we're so used to using our credit cards and our debit cards or even fiat to, you know, to pay and to make things simple. And then when you're dealing with all these complex addresses and then make sure that this is right and then this is right. It's a little it's a little much, I think. Yeah, that's why I think um, projects like uh, Ethereum name service are such a huge help to the space, like being able to just send to like my address, scottsybusiness.eth instead of, you know, like 40, 50 character uh, address is going to make it so much easier for like for like uh, mass adoption and people to be able to like get into this. And and one of the big things that I thought was actually really interesting that I never thought of before I actually got the address was um people like mistyping something so right. if you like misspelt my domain it would say this is a wrong domain like oh, that's you cool. can't yeah and it would say like you can't even send to this because this isn't going to go anywhere um unless someone like bought the wrong version of my domain but i mean like i don't think i'm getting that many transactions that people would bother right. uh, but maybe for like you know someone really popular if they bought like a slightly misspelled version of their name that could be an yeah. issue but but I mean, it, for the most part, it's pretty good for that. And I think that's a really cool feature that you wouldn't otherwise have with like regular sends. 
That makes sense. Yeah, it's we're still early and there's still a lot of things. And I think that's probably one of the biggest roadblocks is like sending money back, sending crypto back and forth is it's not it's scary. Every time I send money back and forth from an exchange or transfer something, I'm just like, oh, crap. Oh, there's crap. a little like fear every time you click and you're like, oh, my God, I really hope this and is. It, yeah, it doesn't matter if it's one Bitcoin or it's five dollars a Bitcoin. I am just like. And then I had to reset my ledger and I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And I knew the, I knew the, you know, the seed phrase was correct, but it's still scary. Like, I'm like, this is, yeah. it doesn't matter how much it is. Like I, I just, it still freaks me out just a bit. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like once we have more of a, like a concrete way of doing things that there isn't like room for human error. I think once we can like the more human error we can remove the like much more safe people will feel using the technology and secure and they won't have right. that like that like uh, resistance against uh sends and just doing all the different operations but uh yeah I, I think i think like we need more uh technology to just make it easier for people like that or do you have any like crypto domains have you played around with that yet or no I think I have something on unstoppable domain. I don't know. And I don't, again, it just right now, it just doesn't fit into my daily life. So unless something makes my life, unless it makes my life easier, then I tr probably will not be using it just because it's, I don't have enough time in the day. And I know it so probably sounds terrible. And if the people, if anyone's watching this and they're like, Oh my God, blah, blah, blah. I, you know, I can only do, I can only do so much in a day. Like it just, you may, it makes it hard unless it's super easy to use or it's going to, you know, help improve the quality of my life. I, you know, I'll talk about it. I acknowledge it, but I, I just try to do things that are easy for me. Yeah, no, I mean, that makes sense. And, um, I mean, it's it, it it's usually just making it easier for other people to send to you, right. which could I, could I mean make your life better if you're getting a lot more money because it's easier? Well, um, yes, it's true. But I mean, when I have when I deal with my clients, they want to send some they want to send me Bitcoin, Ethereum or fiat. And, that's yeah. it. you know, so right now it's just I have, you know, I have a separate address for all that stuff on a separate device. Like I, you know, got all my stuff set up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, but um, I, I definitely recommend for people watching to uh, to check out crypto domains because uh, that's definitely one of the really cool NFTs like uh, use cases that are out there right now. Uh, like, do, do you do you have much thoughts on NFTs? And, I actually and... do. I and I was going to start talking about them. So oh, okay. I worked I worked in healthcare for seven years prior to crypto, and there was a, always a big problem with the medical records. Always, like I would get because I worked with HIV AIDS patients. They're all infectious disease. That I would have people, for example, I had people coming from New York or coming from Italy or coming from wherever to Los Angeles because I worked in Los Angeles County, and they would not have their medical records with them because obviously you don't want to travel with your medical records. But they would forget their meds at home. Or there would be something. Well, because of the time difference in the pharmacy, I couldn't call New York or I couldn't call Italy or wherever their stuff came from. And I couldn't get it verified by, by the pharmacist or by their doctor. So my patients would have to go without meds sometimes. And I think that like, I don't know if it's going to be an NFT sort of like database that they come up with that verifies each person and has like all their medical records stored within that. But I see that that either NFTs or blockchain actually helping with with that problem because it is a it is a really big problem and a lot of people don't think about it and especially if you're like an elderly person and you can't you don't remember all your stuff or remember where your paperwork is if there's a way that everything is like stored on the blockchain to where your medical provider can see all of your stuff because another problem is let's say let's say you let's say your insurance changes and i've had my insurance change a million times because um, both, both my husband and i were entrepreneurs and all kinds of stuff but we'd have to go to different clinics or different pharmacies and stuff and every single time we have to get the information from that place and then bring it to this other office if everything was like consolidated in one i don't know if nfts would be a solution for that if there's some sort of blockchain application eventually that would work so i don't know yeah, yeah, no, that uh, that would definitely be huge. And, you know, interestingly enough, I just did an interview yesterday with Blockbase and their specialty is kind of um, putting databases on blockchain. Okay. So so that might that might actually be like something that would specifically solve that uh, that niche there where like you'd have a database of all that information and then it would exist on the blockchain. And that's kind of what they're focused on. They're doing it on um, EOS private change private chains uh maybe they could have chosen a better uh, blockchain to do it but you know i mean if if the private right. chains can get can get the work done then you know then it's all the same to me 
Yeah, I just, I do, I do have an opinion on it. And I think that like NFTs are really cool. Like I, I actually have some like NFT swag I've gotten from conferences. It just, I'm not able to like play with them or, you know, whatever, but I do, I, I do think that they are really cool. And I think that it's a really good way of kind of making something permanent to where like you have like a souvenir almost. Like I think that they could probably do it with like, um, with like legal records or with court cases or with real estate. There's just, there's so many things that you can utilize that tech kind of technology with. It's just, you know, the, the, the part of making it to where everybody has access to it, to where it's easy to use and it's not super complex. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I, my, my thoughts are, um, that it'll become super mainstream once they can do it right for like video games, I think. Yeah. Video um, games like is what, a, big, big, a big, big one. Like I am, so I like old school video games like Nintendo 64 and Sega Genesis. So I never, like when I was growing up, I kind of got, I did, I was like, that was what I was big doing. But like, I know like my, uh, my stepbrother, he was super big into, to World of Warcraft. And I remember him like talking about like, a, about some, you know, like the shield or the sword or like whatever it is. And he's like, I got this thing and this thing and I can use it to like get this guy. And then like he lost, I don't know what happened. Something lost it, but I understand the use of NFTs for video games for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like people will still buy stuff from other people on video mm -hmm. games, like which is oh, yeah. PayPal, but then it's like, you know, you just hoping that they actually do the trade. Whereas if it was an NFT, then you could do like a trustless uh, trade and then right. it would just solve so many issues for things like that. And I think just tokenizing like in-game items would just be crazy for, for the gaming industry and, and really showing them why crypto could, could really improve their experience. So when we see something like that, I think that'll be like, where we'll see more like a, a lot of mass adoption for nfts but, i think uh, so too i think the gaming industry is really going to help with mass adoption but it'll be it'll be it's going to be different than than the way you would see it as far as healthcare or real estate or with p2p transactions just that type of stuff it's gonna be a little bit different so yeah yeah i think nfts is that is a, is a very niche space where there's going to be very specific use cases that are going to be very very different across um all of the kind of possible uses for it but um yeah so i i mean that that's kind of everything that i have in mind to talk about is there anything else you wanted to maybe cover before we end this off i'm thinking i'm like no i think we, we touched a lot of really cool stuff um, uh, I think that's it. I'm trying to think, is there anything else going on? We need to talk about, oh, Bitcoin 2020 was just canceled. <laughs> I have to call and get, to get my, my flight ticket, see if they'll give me a voucher or something like that. Um, but other than that, I think that's it. I think we covered it all. We talked about some really cool things. Uh, before we end off, what are your hopes slash predictions for Bitcoin price this year? Okay, so happening is coming up, and that's going to be a very bullish event. However, yeah. just because we have happening doesn't mean that price is going to moon. There's a lot of things that have to happen. Um, Bitcoin is still pretty. I I'm not saying that it's overvalued. I'm not saying having having is priced in, but I wouldn't get too excited until we actually break and sustain fourteen thousand dollars. Once that happens, then I would be a little bit more excited. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I uh, I'm I'm really excited for the having. So. You know, we'll we'll see. It's coming up in May. I think it's estimated for like May twelfth, I believe. But right, but um, but with this virus thing coming, it's impacting some miners out in Asia. So it could mm -hmm. kind of impede the progress of happening because it's kind of like a. I did research on this, so I know it's kind of like a floating date. It really just depends on the miners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, for all we know, it could be sooner. But yeah, you're definitely right. I didn't really uh, consider that. So it might end up being later. Mm -hmm. um, but either way, people can go on and check online. And uh, I, I can't remember what the website was. It might have been like BitcoinBlockHaving.com or something I'm, like yeah, that. I'm sure if you countdown. type in... I'm sure if you type in the have any or something, it'll pop up. Yeah, yeah. There's a few like countdown websites where people can go and check out like the estimated time. But uh, yeah, definitely, definitely keep an eye on that. And um, yeah, so I, I'm hoping I'm, I'm bullish for this year as well. But I definitely don't have the technical uh, analysis that you do because you do that on a very regular yeah, I, basis. So, so that's kind of your jam. I'm doing I do it daily. And right now people, always, they do ask me about 
price and whatnot. And I'm just like, well, like there's some things that need to happen. We've been in this, essentially since we hit 14 K we've been like in a downtrend. Like if you look at the chart and we have yet to make a higher high. So we need to really break and sustain 14 K for me to be like, a like, like I'm bullish long-term. Like I'm very bullish long-term on the price of Bitcoin. I've taken the money from my daughter's savings account. I dumped it into Bitcoin. She has got her, you know, some Bitcoin saved for her when she's of age. So I'm bullish long-term. Um, but as far as current price and when this is going to happen, when we're going to go to the moon, um, I'm not going to tell you, oh, it's going to be this date or this date. The first thing that I would need to see is a is realistically a break and break and flip a support of 14K. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. All right. Well, uh, I think that's a good point to leave it. Um, people, uh, thank you so much for watching and thank you so much for coming on and uh, and doing this. I really, really appreciate it. People definitely go and check out the O Show and uh and check out everything that she's up to um on twitter she's at crypto wendy o i don't know if you want to drop some of your other uh, social handles unless it's the same everything is crypto wendy o the show i am the even my youtube handle is crypto wendy o but i'm just calling it the o show just for just for posterity um but yeah everything is crypto wendy o i've got a website with all the events that i'm doing i'm not going to have too much um update or events right now just because of everything that's going on and i'm trying to finish school this is my last semester but yeah, if you guys want to stay up to date or you guys want to check my content out or follow me on Twitter, I am on Twitter shit posting with <laughs> in between trading and, and all that fun stuff. So yeah. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, if you guys want to get some uh, technical analysis on Bitcoin and everything else in the uh, crypto space, I don't know how many coins you uh, do analysis on, but uh, definitely I, go check out her yeah. channel. So I do, I do, I do do altcoin requests. I do live stream every Sunday night at like six to seven p.m. And I'll, if you guys come in the chat and you drop a request, I'll do it for you. And I also do post requests on Twitter. I just haven't really done it too much because I'm not trading. The only thing I'm actively trading right now is like Bitcoin and Ethereum, and I'm not doing too many altcoins at the moment. There's not, like obviously Doge. I've got some Doge. My do my bags are packed with Doge, but I'm not doing too much altcoin trading right now, just because I've got I gotta gotta get that school done first. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, well, well, great. Uh, uh, good luck with your final semester, and uh, and thank you so much again for coming on. Thank you so much, Scott. Have a good rest of your day. Bye.